Welcome to another episode of Preferred Walk On. I'm your host, Max Chavis. We got another interview for you guys today, but it's not a player. It's actually one of the biggest superstars in the college football media world, Taylor Tannenbaum, host of ACC PM on ACC Network. Taylor, I'm a huge, huge fan of your work. Thanks so much for coming on. Max, first of all, I do I'm I'm honored for that intro. <laughs> um, you you are the star of this show, so I appreciate you having me on. Uh, this is really awesome. I've been following along with all the stuff you've been uh, starting to put out here. Oh, thank you so much. That means the world, honestly. But obviously, we mentioned before you're hosting ACC Network. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you was like, this ACC is going to look pretty different, honestly, pretty soon, probably. You know, there's seven schools right now that are talking about potentially leaving the ACC, what is your opinion on what the Atlantic Coast Conference could look like in the near future? In the near future, I think you're going to see the Atlantic Coast Conference looking the same. Um, okay. There's obviously a grant of rights that is holding this conference together. I think the conversations that have been had lately about revenue generation and the revenue gap are honest, real conversations. And they're conversations that need to be had. Um, and instead of looking at it as more of like a there's a rift. It's more of just growth that needs to take place, right? These tough conversations on the other side is where the rainbows happen, right? So with that being said, is the college landscape changing? Absolutely. Does the conference need to change with it? 100%. Um, they are in a deal with ESPN um, TV wise until 2036. So as of right now, uh, they're joined together by that. Now they did just come out with a plan to dabble in some uneven revenue distribution uh, starting in 2024 with the expansion of the college football playoff, which means there will be incentive-based revenue. So if you make the college football playoff, if you make the NCAA tournament, you'll get a little bit more money out of the pie, which is a way to try to, you know, make that gap a little bit smaller. Um, but I believe until some other big moves are made, it's probably going to be a, a point of conversation. But for right now, you're going to see the ACC pretty much intact for the foreseeable future. So say if like the worst case scenario happens for the conference and Clemson, Florida State, Miami, all these big schools leave. Do you see them looking to add uh, any other schools from other conferences and what schools, if, if you do think of any, uh, could be potential fits for the new ACC? To be honest with you, I'm not sure they've crossed that bridge. Okay. And I'm not sure that that's a bridge that they're willing to even start to cross because these are staples of the conference, Clemson, mm -hmm. Florida States, and the Miamis, and even the Virginia Techs of the world, right? A lot of them are, are members that have been here for a long time. So um, for right now, I think they're just set on making sure those that are in stay. And mm -hmm. those that are the biggest part of this conference that generate a lot of the revenue um, are content and are happy. Uh, so as of right now, I don't, I don't think anyone's looking in any other direction. Okay, so obviously you've been following this for very closely for a really long time. If you had to make a prediction, I want to put you on the spot here, but if you had to make a prediction, do you think they ultimately, you know, come to a terms with these seven schools, or do you think ultimately these seven schools look to the Big Ten or SEC or something like that? Ultimately, I think the ACC is going to stay intact. I really do. It's one of the deepest rooted conferences when it, in terms of history. Money is always going to be a driving point, um, and, and they'll get something done. The conversations mm -hmm. have to be had. Um Everyone has to come to the table with their opinions. And sometimes you may not like what somebody else is going to say, uh, but they're very, very smart people in these rooms. Very, very smart athletic directors and presidents and coaches led by uh, a great commissioner and Jim Phillips. So with that being said, I do think um, that there will be a point that everyone's going to be happy. Now, the thing is, the college football landscape is changing like mm -hmm. crazy. So it isn't even just the ACC. This is really everyone around the country. I don't know what college football is going to look like in five years. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us do, you know. So it could it come to a point where there's two conferences in the entire country and that's just the way that it is? Very possible because it's starting to sort of feel like there's a shift. So with that being said, I think the ACC is going nowhere. I, I, I will point out that they made more money than they ever have before this last year. So mm -hmm. it's not like the conference is broke. Um, it's just the SEC and the Big Ten, realistically, uh, with their television deals, make a ton of a lot more money. Uh, so until that gets sorted out, the money differential is probably going to be pretty much the same. 
But hey, for right now, they just came to a conclusion on some uneven revenue distribution models. And um, if that can help tide people over and maybe close that gap and make people happy, uh, then that, that bides some time, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I know you're a proud Florida State grad. Say if Florida State does make the move to the SEC, are you going to try to make the move within ESPN to the SEC network too to try to stay stay with your Seminoles a little bit? No, I'm, I'm, good, over, <laughs> I'm good over here in Florida State. You know, I think um, – you know, uh, athletic director, Michael Alford, mm -hmm. he just, he just wants his voice heard. Um, and I think he, he, along with Graham Neff at Clemson and down there at, at Miami with Dan Radakovich, um, they love the ACC. You know, they've been a big part of the ACC. They win in the ACC and that's a big deal. Um, uh, the other side of this is the academic side too. And, and mm -hmm. these are, these are schools that really pride themselves academically too. And you don't get that anywhere else. Um, except for in the ACC, the balance of athletics and academics as well. Um, so for me, ACC Network's where I'm at. Florida State's staying in the ACC, and um, it feels like this is going to be a big turntable season uh, for, for Florida State and the ACC. We'll see. I was just going to make that transition right there. We're finally talking about some on-field stuff now. So your Seminoles, I am all in on Florida State next year. I think they're winning the ACC. I think they're making the college football playoff. What do you think that this Florida State team is capable of? I think this Florida State, everything's in front of this Florida State team, period. Mm -hmm. um, they have the talent. They have 87% of their production returning, including a couple of transfers that they brought in because we know Mike Norvell in Florida State has been incredible in the transfer portal. Um, they have a schedule that in the very beginning gives them opportunity to say, hey, we're here. Um, hey, we're one of the best teams in the country, starting off with LSU. And then you mm -hmm. close out the month of September against Clemson in Death Valley. So they really have a chance to make a statement. Um, but when it comes to the real reality of the situation is they haven't been in this position in a very long time. Uh, expectations aren't something they've had like this in a very long time. How do they manage those expectations? Uh, if it goes well in that opening game against LSU, do you ride that wave? If it doesn't go well, how do you come back from that wave? Because for the first time in ever, Florida State is part of a conference that has no divisions, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not binded to just being part of the Atlantic or the coastal. And if you drop a game, it's not the end of the world. Uh, so we're going to learn very quickly in September if Florida State's a contender. I believe they have every opportunity in front of them. They have a quarterback who's going to be a Heisman contender, in my opinion. They have playmakers all over the field. They have the confidence um of the school too which is a really really big deal so i would say everything the sky's the limit it's just a matter of what they do with it absolutely and I, i'm you know i was lucky enough to talk to jordan travis before and he's a guy that you mentioned heisman contender i actually think he's gonna end up winning the heisman trophy next year i'm, I'm all in on him too his journey has been you know so amazing you know he was a good quarterback for a while for florida state transferred from louisville now he's one of the best in the country uh, just what do you think you've learned the most, you know, watching him over the last few years of Florida State and, and how real do you think those Heisman chances are for him next year? Man, in such a world where you want instant gratification and mm -hmm. success, he has been so patient and he has been so um, gracious, uh, I would say, because they've pulled him off the bench and put him in games. They've taken him off the field and put him back on the bench year in and year out. He's competed for a starting job and has ended up as a backup, but then eventually has turned into a starter because of injury or what other situations has been going on. And he's never looked to transfer again. He's never doubted himself. He's continued to keep his head down and do his work. And that's what I've loved about Jordan Travis is he's waited for his time and his turn and he's made the most of that. Um, and he's, he shined on the biggest of stages, and now he really does have the pieces around him. Now he has the experience. Now he's gotten better as a passer because I know that was a knock on him in the beginning that all mm -hmm. he does is, is run around. He's gotten better in the pocket. He's improved everywhere he needs to, um, and he's been very humble in his approach. And I love that he's kind of like a stealth bomber. He's very quiet in his approach. I know Florida State has launched his Heisman campaign. There's a website for it and everything, but he's very much like, look, I, I'm I'm going to go as the team goes, and unless yeah. my team's succeeding, I'm this award doesn't come. So he's very team first oriented. I've loved his patience, um, and just how gracious he's been in every stage of his college career. Absolutely, and yeah, that was something I brought up too. I was like, hey man, you know the Heisman hype and all that. He's like, man, I don't I don't care about that. He's he like, I just it. I just want to win. I saw like I was yeah. like, you know what? That's the perfect mindset to have, Jordan. I'm sure. Uh, a lot of people watching right now are like, listen, I could talk about Florida State with you all day. I'm, I'm That's how much I'm in on them this year. But I'm sure a lot of people watching right now are saying, okay, we got to talk about the elephant in the room. Like the school that's ruled this conference for the last eight or so years 
and Clemson. Uh, they are still very much in the conversation next year. Obviously, they got a new offensive coordinator. Garrett Riley is one of the best in the country. Cade Klubnick has got a lot of hype, too, as their new quarterback. What are your expectations for Clemson next year as a real college football playoff contender with those two new pieces on that offense? Okay, so realistically speaking, I, I would love to pick my alma mater to win the conference. I refuse to pick anyone aside from Clemson mm-hmm. until somebody shows me otherwise. I know That's Pitt, fair. Won, Pitt won the ACC a couple of years ago, but no one's been more consistent than Clemson. And really, they have a defense returning a lot of talent mm-hmm. and adding more and an offense that's only going to get better with Garrett Riley at the helm and a Cade Klubnik, who's very young, who still needs to be molded. This is a team that has four and five star players all over a proven coach in Dabo Sweeney. I'm not counting Clemson out until somebody proves me otherwise. I, I'm just not. So I think this offense, you're going to see a lot more explosion. Um, I know a lot of people, especially Clemson fans, are like, why aren't we utilizing more of the field in the middle of the field? You're going to see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I've loved about Garrett Riley and his career is that he takes what he has and does the most with what he has. Um, so he's inheriting a really talented Clemson roster, much more talented than TCU has mm-hmm. uh, or had last year. And look what he was able to do with Max Duggan and everything. Um, And he's going to make it look completely different. You're going to see deep shots down the field. You're going to see them utilizing the middle of the field. We saw it a little bit in the spring game. I think the tight ends are going to be used a lot more. Will Shipley out of the backfield because – honestly, he's their playmaker on offense. He's their mm-hmm. greatest athlete that they have offensively. He's going to put Will Shipley in positions, uh, catching out of the backfield, running the ball um, in order to to be as successful as they possibly can. I'm pumped to see what they do. Um, I know everyone's like, pump the brakes. We don't want Garrett Riley to just be the savior of this Clemson <laughs> program, but really this program doesn't need saving. They're just fine. Right. Um, it's just a little bit of an extra umph to get back into the conversation of the college football playoff that they've missed out on the last couple of years, and they're very capable of doing so. Absolutely. And, you know, we talked about two exciting quarterbacks in ACC and Jordan Travis and Kate Klubnick. The best one is Drake May, I think, in, at North Carolina. And, you know, he's a top Heisman candidate right now. I just don't see how he can win the Heisman only because I don't think North Carolina's going to be good enough in order for him to win the Heisman Trophy. But what do you think about Drake May? You know, he could be one of the top picks in the NFL draft as well. I think he has, if he plays anything like he did last year and adds to it because it's going to be year two for him, he could be a number one overall pick mm-hmm. in the draft. Um, he has the pieces around him to have an outstanding offense. I don't expect any fall off from Drake May at all. Chip Lindsay's coming in uh, to kind of rework that offense a little bit. He was great with Phil Longo, but Chip Lindsay's going to take over and see what they can do with that. I think they're going to pick up exactly where they left off offensively. Now the question's defensively. Can Gene Chizik's defense in year two take an extra step? Because they're this close. They are this close to just being a little bit better and having a double-digit win season. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think Drake May learned a lot at the end of last year. I think he learned once the hype is on you what life is like. He's going into the season knowing what that's like, and that's a really beautiful thing. Um, He's been mature since day one. But when it got to November, all of a sudden, the noise was really, really loud, right? And and I think they stumbled a bit, but I think he learned a lot from that. I do still think he has a chance to win the Heisman only because I think his numbers are insane. Yes. And if they can get to double-digit wins, if that defense is a little bit better, and to an ACC championship game, they have a viable chance at, 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 at him winning a Heisman, mm-hmm. I, I, would, I would think, because his numbers are going to be so off the charts. Yeah, that's completely fair. They're going to rely on him a lot next year as well. Uh, So I I hate to give you a deep cut right now, but I know all my Syracuse friends would hate me if I didn't ask you about them. I graduated from Syracuse. They had a great year this past year. Dino Babers, I don't know if I'm completely sold on him yet, but we'll see. They lose a a couple coordinators as well. Uh, Do you think that's kind of a fluky year for Syracuse? And how do you think they go in this Dino Babers era? Do you think you see them maybe, you know, going for another head coach pretty soon? No, I'm a huge fan of Dino Babers, first and Mm -hmm. foremost. I think he has a great way of connecting with his players, and he has a brilliant football mind. Um, It's Syracuse, and the reality is it's a tougher place. Potentially, I know the history of Syracuse football is outstanding, um, and he's trying to get him back to that, you know, that, 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 that height there in central New York. Uh, there is some change, but what I do like is the consistency within the offense. You have Gary mm-hmm. Schrager coming back as your quarterback who 
honestly is a really good player and he's going to be even better than he was last year. He's going to be healthy too, which is a bonus. And um, you have Jason Beck now, who's going to be the offensive coordinator, who was his quarterback coach last year. So you have consistency, at least on that side of the ball, you lose a Sean Tucker, but coach Dino Babers was really high on Juwan Price from the spring game. He's the one name that he mentioned. Um, We also saw LaQuint Allen in, in their bowl game really shine. So I think they'll do a nice job replacing Sean Tucker's production around a Gadskin Mm -hmm. is going to take another step. They do need a couple more playmakers to step up. Now the big question is defensively and coach Babers has been honest about it's going to be in in the back half of that defense. You lose some NFL talent and and induce chestnut and Garrett Wilson there in the secondary. How do they replicate um, that production they had there and the big key for Syracuse, they're going to have to get off to a big start again. Uh, last year they had that six and start. It was awesome. And then the, their schedule got really, really tough. They have a schedule now in the beginning where they can have a four and start. Um, and then the month of October <laughs> for them is pretty brutal. It goes <laughs> Clemson, UNC, Florida state, and then a Thursday night game at Virginia tech under Ooh. the lights, uh, which is, never easy to do in Blacksburg. So with that being said, it does lighten up in November, uh, but a fast start for, for Syracuse is going to have to be the key. I have all the faith in the world um, in Dino Babers. It's just about getting some playmakers up there to central New York offensively. I think they have um, some talent defensively. We'll see what they have. So I, I think the ACC is, is pretty, you know, loaded top to bottom this year. I think it's a pretty good conference this year. However, that could be bad for them in terms of getting a college football playoff team because you can just see so many teams beating up on each other. Do you ultimately think the ACC gets a team in the college football playoff or do you think this is the third straight year that the conference misses out on it? I actually think this is the best opportunity for them to get back in because of the fact that there are no more divisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you're going to have the two best teams in the conference playing for an ACC championship, which we know playing for a conference championship and winning a conference championship certainly factors in two teams getting into the college football playoffs. So if you had a one loss, let's just pick two teams. The two best teams that I think in the conference right now are Clemson and Florida state. If you have a one loss Clemson and an undefeated Florida state um, and Florida state loses in the conference game, but Clemson wins with one loss, they're going to get into a college football playoff. Um, So I think there is the best opportunity this year without the divisions to get back to a playoff. I think that's a great point right there. The divisions, I think, are a play a huge part in that. But, uh, you know, looking ahead to next year, who do you think would be your two picks for ACC Offensive Player of the Year? And who do you think would be the ACC Defensive Player that you fit to pick right now, too? Okay, so if I had to pick, we just touched on him. I think Drake May, once again, is going to be the Offensive Player of the Year. I just do. Mm -hmm. He's so – he's – He's, he's a gem. He's a diamond. He, he's, he's a rare breed. He's, you don't come across a lot of them like Drake may. I think his numbers, once again, like I said, are going to be outstanding. I think he's going to do great things and he's going to take even bigger steps than he did last year. So I'm pumped to see what Drake may does and what this Mac Brown UNC squad does defensively. I think it's coming out of Clemson. Hey, look, if Jared verse stays healthy at Florida state, he mm-hmm. had some numbers he put up last year. He missed a few games because of health. Um, that that could contend for defensive player of the year. I absolutely think so. And and he came from a small school. He's going to be even better year two in, in a division one power five program. Um, but I think it's coming out of Clemson and that linebacking core, Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter Jr. They put up numbers last year and this duo, they're best friends, they're mm-hmm. roommates. Um, they are so cerebral. What, talking to them, I did the Clemson spring game. They are, they're NFL ready today. Yeah, They're NFL ready today in every aspect of life. Mm -hmm. Um, And they are dogs and this defense is stacked. And I really think between the two of them, if it's not one of the two of them, I would be surprised if not somebody on that defense, but I would go Barrett Carter or Jeremiah Trotter Jr. I actually was able to talk to Trotter before and yeah, NFL ready is the exact word I would say for him. You know, his dad was a pro bowl linebacker too. Uh, yeah, he seems like he's a pro already. And I've actually, like, they host a podcast together, too, which I didn't know about. I watched a few episodes. They're actually. awesome kids. They're awesome. I love men. I love them so much. Yeah, there's two yeah. superstars. I actually I agree with you. I think those are the two picks I would go with, too. But uh, so we talked about Syracuse before. I don't know if I would say they're the underrated team to watch out for. Is there an underrated team or maybe an underrated player that you think nobody's talking about right now, but at the end of the season, we're going to look back and be like, how on earth do we miss that guy or this team? Yeah, okay, so – Weirdly enough, we just talked to um, new NC State offense coordinator Robert and I on mm-hmm. PM this week. 
Um, he's obviously a brilliant mind when it comes to offenses. He's done great things at Virginia, did great things at Syracuse this last year, and he's reunited with Brennan Armstrong. Defensively, I almost never worry about NC State because they're so consistently good under Dave Dorn. Offensively, if they can create the same magic that they had at Virginia in 2021 – NC State's home slate is tough, but all their tough games are, are at home. Uh, they, they start off with Notre Dame. They have Louisville, Marshall, Clemson, Miami, and UNC at home. NC State, if they can recreate that magic, like I said, could maybe do some damage in the ACC. I could see also Louisville, weirdly enough, with Jeff Brom taking over as the head coach. Their schedule shapes out to have no Florida State, no Clemson, and no North Carolina. Wow. And their home games are against Indiana, Notre Dame, and Kentucky. Those are three of their biggest games on their schedule, and they're at home in their friendly confines. So with that being said, um, Jeff Brown's an offensive mind. They can put some points on the board. I don't know. Don't sleep on Louisville either. Uh, Player-wise, though, I could say maybe there's a couple of transfers into the conference wide receiver from Virginia tech, Ollie Jennings coming from old dominion. Mm -hmm. I think he could potentially have a big year uh, with Grant Wells at quarterback, whoever they decide to go with that quarterback there. Colby young at wide receiver at Miami. This is going to be a year or two for him in the system. He transferred in last year. Very, very late. He's worked on his body with a healthy Tyler Van Dyke. Colby young has the build and the speed and the athleticism to be a really good wideout. Um, and when I was at Clemson for the spring game, we'll do a little defense, a couple of young boys, Peter Woods, number 11, defensively, everyone ranting and raving about this guy. Dabo Sweeney says, I don't know that we've ever recruited a player like this before, period, point blank. Wow. And I don't know that he has any deficits, which is crazy coming in as a freshman. Watch out for him. 11 flying all over the field. Um, and then at Miami on the other side, defensively, we haven't talked about them a ton. They're bringing in the talent. It's just what they do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Desmond Bain is a name coming out of high school who is a dog. Um, and he had a couple of sacks in the spring game. He had like 29 sacks in his senior season in high school. Wow. He's gigantic. Holy. He's insane. Comes from <laughs> Miami Central. So that's another name I would look out for. I know they're young. Um, but oh, sorry, excuse me, Ruben Bain, not Desmond Bain. He's a basketball player. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was gonna say oh, it sounds Ru like a basketball Ruben, player. <laughs> Ruben Bain, Ruben Bain from Miami. Right. Is, is a name for the future that I would really look out for. Taylor, this is an awesome, awesome interview. I really appreciate you taking the time. Check her out on ACC PM on ACC Network with Taylor. I really, really appreciate you taking the time and talking to me on this. This is amazing. I appreciate you, Max. Thanks so much.